The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. I always laugh at that because if you follow us for any length of time, you'll realize that is how I start every single sermon, all of our Instagram teachings. But it is kind of funny because as I've been preaching here in Brazil, when I get into the pulpit and they hand me the microphone, it's sometimes not even the first thing I say. Sometimes I don't even say it at all. I just uh, I just start by blessing the people, which is a uh, a very interesting thing to see how the Lord moves. But uh, it is always a pleasure of mine when I hear somebody look at me and go, "Good morning, church," because I know that they are watching and following along, and it is uh, such a blessing and such an honor to be able to share the word of God. So what we're going to do today, we're going to go back into Psalm chapter 2. This is going to be our third day in Psalm chapter 2. And we're going to uh, continue studying through this. We spent two days on it so far, really looking at the aspect of the heathen raging and the vain things and what they call bondage. So we're going to continue to go into this. We're going to go into the next little section of Psalm chapter 2. I said it the first day, but there are people that when they talk about the Psalm chapter two, they call it like a four act drama. Like there's four different things that happen. First couple verses, then some more verses, the next and the next, really like four different parts. The first being the people, then the Lord, then Jesus, and then David's response. Um, so we're going to maybe study it that way. I just want to continue just to study the verses to get the full understanding of what David is trying to tell us in Psalm chapter 2. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, Amen and amen. Well, let's go to Psalm chapter 2, and let's just begin. It says, Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and they shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So let's talk about this for just a minute. We have already spent two days discussing the heathen raging, what they imagine as a vain thing, the willful choice to set and take counsel against the Lord, the word, the plan, the will of God, but specifically in his anointed. 
meaning that they are coming against Jesus of Nazareth, specifically the way the Antichrist will come against Jesus, which will result in an environment in which persecution and martyrdom will reach levels never before seen in history. We talked about that the past two days. We put a, a pretty decent focus on that because it is inside of that context that man at the deepest level of the heart will choose righteousness and holiness and choose the Lord or will choose the other. But what I want you to see is the Lord's response to so the, the heathen rage. They imagine vain things. They take counsel. They set themselves. They call the Lord's plan and purposes and ways bonded. You know, we talked about that yesterday, how they will say, just let us do as we please and it will produce what we want. Well, there's a whole lot of people that think, well, let them just love each other, you know, quote unquote, because it's not real love. Talking about the immorality of and the perversion of uh, the gay marriage. Well, if you realize one thing, if you just look at the statistics of it and look at the 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 reports that they put out, there are more divorces, suicide uh, and all these different things inside of the gay community comparatively to heterosexuals, meaning that it's not actually producing what you thought it would, which, you know, you're like, it's going to fulfill this void if you live in perversion, but it doesn't. It actually produces a greater level of emptiness, which leads to a greater depth of uh, a feeling. I mean, emptiness is probably the best word, but what leads people farther and farther away until they make the final choice in which they take their own life. But there's the Lord's response to this. So when you see the vain imaginations and they rage and they go against the Lord and his anointed and persecution and martyrdom and all of these things, and they're trying to promote immorality and harlotry and adultery and all these things on the world, it says that he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Ooh, I mean, if you had it, this laugh is not a a a oh, this is funny. This is a laugh, as in you think that's what you're going to do. You think that that's going to be the way to overcome me? It's a joke. You know what what you're doing is is a joke to the Lord. I mean, he laughs. Because what you're doing will produce nothing. It's of none effect. It says he'll laugh. I mean, that's <clears throat> I don't I don't I don't know any other way to explain this, but that's intense. For the Lord to look down at what you're doing in in complete rebellion against him and for him to laugh. Because he knows what it will produce. And the fact is, you know what you're doing, yet you choose it anyway. It's a terrible thing. <clears throat> but the Lord shall have them in derision, meaning he will have them in opposition to himself, meaning he will mock. It, 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 it will be a laughter as if you're intimidating somebody or, or imitating somebody of a foreign land. You know, you you're you are happy, and, and the rulers and the kings of this earth are laughing. Oh, we got this, we're gonna destroy the Lord. And he's it's like he's mocking you because you think that's gonna work, and it's not. You know, the kings and the rulers of this earth think that they're gonna pull all of their might together and they will defeat Jesus. It's not going to happen. You will be utterly destroyed because of this. The Lord will hold them in derision. Woo! That's strong. That's intense. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. Now, one thing I want you to see about this, where we're, we're going to talk about wrath and we're going to talk about the vexing of the Lord, is that the wrath and the vexing of the Lord in his displeasure of us, or when I say us, I'm talking about the world, not, not us as believers. 
We'll just we'll say the world. We won't say us. When the Lord puts them in derision, when he comes against them in his wrath, he speaks against them in his wrath, and he vexes them with his sore displeasure, it is in direct relationship to choice. So what I mean by that is man has the ability to choose. It's what love is. It, love is not love unless it is chosen. The, the, the whole understanding of love is the fact that there is choice. You get to choose which one you want. Well, the people of this world will have the ability to choose. They will know and they will say no. They will K-N-O-W. They'll have the knowledge of Jesus. They will have the knowledge of the gospel, yet they will say no. And oh, they will reject it. <clears throat> it's a difference. And these we're not talking about people who are ignorant. People who don't know the Lord and are just living in sin that if you preach the gospel, they say yes. We're talking about people that know the Lord. They have the knowledge, yet they don't love the truth. And they say no, they reject God. And then that's when they consider his things as bondage. They come against him. They come against the Lord and Jesus. And it's because of that. That's the reason that the Lord holds them in derision. That's the reason why he laughs. That's the reason why he speaks wrath and he vexes the people. And this is what the world hates. The world hates this right here, the vexing of the Lord. Now, we understand, or at least the world understands, the devil. And, and, and the devil did this. Because so many people in the church are like, oh, it's the devil. Well, there's a lot of times it's not the devil. It's just you. It's your own lustful desires. And it's your own rebellion against God. The devil ain't doing nothing. You, you giving the devil credit for something you're doing. You know, it's you need to make a choice to, to resist these things. But the reason why I say this is... Their choices that they made of their own will is what is going to cause the vexing in their life. It's what's going to bring forth wrath against them. It's because they made a choice. This is not accidental. There are so many people in the church and in the world, or let's say in the world and in the church, because this doctrine is starting to creep into the church. It's becoming more and more prevalent. That if God is love, then he wouldn't judge. No, it's the fact that he is love that he does judge. And we're going to talk about, we're going to, we got one more verse to go in this passage and we're going to, we're going to make it all tie together. But what I want you to understand is that the, the derision, the wrath and the vexing of God is against them that have made willful choices. They are in rebellion against God. We're not talking about somebody that's half in, half out. You know, maybe they'll say yes. We're not talking about the people that are born again. We're not talking about God's church. The reason why the doctrine of the rapture before the tribulation is so prevalent, I've heard so many people say it, is because they say the church is not going to be judged by God. You're right. Because the judgments of God are not against God's people. Well, they think because the judgments of God are not against God's people, which we both agree upon, then that means you won't be here during it. That's not the case. The judgments of God are not against God's people. The judgments of God are against them that he holds in derision. The one that the wrath and the vexing is against is against those that are in rebellion against God. That's who it's coming against. I tell people all the time, when you read through the book of the Revelation, it's one of my favorite books in the Bible. If you read it correctly, it's a love story. Just always remember that. The book of the Revelation is the revelation of the man Christ Jesus. That's what the book is. It's the unveiling, unfolding, declaring of a man. That man is declared through events. They are not a book of events. It's a book of a man declared through events. We see the events to see the man. We don't see the events to see the events. That's 
might sound real plain and simple, but so many people just go walk up to somebody. What's the book of the Revelation about? And people go, it's about the end time events. No, it's not. It's about a man that you see when you tell about the events. You know, if I told you about myself, and I told you about all the things that I do for you, it's not about knowing that I did it. It's about seeing me in it. That's the point. You know, if you go out with a group of people and you pay for all the food, they see the event that you did, the paying for the food. But it's not about the fact you paid for it. It's about the fact that they saw your heart, why you paid for it. That's the same thing with the book of the Revelation. We see events to understand a man behind the events. The book of the Revelation is about seeing Jesus. But also, if you read through the book, which so many, very, very few people actually take the time to study it, read through it, End Times Curriculum Part 1, End Times Curriculum Part 2. If you haven't taken those, you need to take both of those to really get a full grasp on it. But the reason why I'm saying this, if you read through the seals and you read through the trumpet judgments, one thing you will notice is they are in portions. One third, one fourth. There is only portions of the earth affected. But after the blowing of the seventh trumpet, Revelation chapter 14, it says that the mystery of God comes to its fulfillment, which is what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, the mystery of God, the blowing of the last trumpet. It's the rapture of the church. Then you see in the seven vials a whole. It says the whole earth, whole earth, the whole earth. There's no longer portions. The first seven seals and the seven trumpets are partial, not whole. Well, why would 14 of them be partial and seven of them be full? It's because the church is here. If the church is here, God cannot judge all of the world because his church is still in the world. Once the church is out of the world, God judges the whole world. That's a very important point. We see this dynamic take place of which the vexing, the wrath, and the people that are held in derision are those against the Lord. Those that rage, imagine a vain thing, set themselves take counsel against the Lord, that say his things are bondage. Those are the people held in derision. Those are the people that he speaks wrath against. Those are the people that the Lord vexes not God's people. It's very important to see this. But then the Lord says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now, when it talks about the holy hill of Zion, it's talking about Jerusalem. It's talking about Jerusalem. It's talking about Jesus reigning as king in Jerusalem. You know, and that's, it's a very important point. What we're going to see next, we're, we're not going to go into it today, is the response of Jesus to receive the inheritance. And then the next part is David's response or what he tells the people to give in response to understanding this narrative. So when we read Psalm chapter 2, we're reading the storyline at an overview. There is a willful rebellion against the God of Israel, against Jesus, his son, the Messiah. It's against Jesus, and it's against the God of Israel. That's the main overarching premise of, that's what sets the stage. Willful rebellion. I'm not talking about ignorance. I'm not talking about just something that happens. We are talking about a willful choice of rebellion against God, setting themselves against him. Because of that setting against him, there is a response. There is the vexing of God. To them that he holds in derision, those that are in willful rebellion, because he now speaks his wrath. The wrath and the vexing of God is to remove 
those people that he hold in derision, those people that are plotting a vain thing against Jesus. That's what it's against. It's to remove that. Now, if you remember what we talked about the past two days, what they have in their mind, not only the rage that they're doing, the fact that they're raging, killing Christians and all that, but the vanity of their thought. One, they think that they can win, which they can't. They will lose. They will be utterly destroyed by the breath of Jesus and the sword proceeding out of his mouth, which is the word of God. He will gaze upon the Antichrist, blow on him, and he will be thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus will be victorious. Just understand that. They will not win. So there is a vanity of the way they think think that what they are doing is right and what they will do will come to fulfillment and it won't their plan is going to end up losing but the reason why i say that today is the other thing that they have in vanity or emptiness in their mind is doing what they want their own sin the things that they call as bondage to the Lord that they are coming against so they can do as they please, that part is what will be changed when Jesus is set upon the holy hill of Zion. So he is set as king, as ruler and leader of the earth. Now, what I want you to understand is the reason in which God judges the reason in which God judges is to remove all of the things that hinder love. Now, we say that because we get that from a, uh, a, a ministry that we partner with. But we truly agree with this because what God is doing is removing all of the vanity from off of the earth. Removing all of the emptiness, the vain imaginations of thinking that I can do it in and of myself. It's called pride. I know what's best for me. I will do it of myself. And the Lord says, I'm going to hold you in derision. I'm going to laugh because of that. Because it's a joke. What you're doing is a joke. Not that the Lord is making a joke, but what you're doing is a joke. So he laughs at it. He holds you in derision. He's, he brings forth wrath. He vexes them. And that vexing is going to come not only by the pressure of the Lord, but the actual judgment of God in the book of the Revelation to bring forth Jesus, his king, sitting upon the holy hill of Zion. That's what it's producing. God has a plan. The plan is for Jesus to rule and reign in Jerusalem. To get to that point, he has to judge to remove all of the evil and ungodliness from off the face of the earth. So that way Jesus does reign from his holy hill. Now, the reason why I wanted to put a big emphasis on the plan of God in this is that it is the plan of God. That is the summation of the story. I mean, there's more to come, but that's the summation. That's the big overarching theme of the end time narrative is that God's going to allow man to choose at the deepest level of the heart, whether they want God or not. And through your own choice, you will receive the recompense of reward. You will be repaid for the choices that you make. Whether you choose God or not, you will receive based on that choice. So there is no, I didn't know. There is no people that will have an excuse that will be able to say, I didn't know that that was the consequence of the choice. They will know the choice they're making. They will know what God says the consequence, yet they will choose to say, I'm going to try to stop it. I don't believe it. They're going to walk in unbelief. They're not going to love the truth because they're going to think that they can do opposite, that it will prosper. And God says, that's vain. That's what's empty. You think that doing your own way, doing your own path and having your own way will produce fulfillment, but it's vanity because you will be utterly vexed, 
in my wrath because I will judge you for it. No one that opposes Jesus will not be judged. They will all be judged by God. They will face the judgment of God. And Jesus will rule and reign in Jerusalem. There is no stopping that. That is a part of the plan of God. He will march from Edom to Basra. He will blow on the Antichrist, throw him in the lake of fire, cleanse the temple, and sit as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the plan of God. And it will not be thwarted. It will come to fulfillment. And you need to understand that. Now, the reason why we want to understand that is to be prepared. Because in this generation where sin and transgressors come to fullness, where martyrdom is across the whole face of the earth, where the persecution of the church comes into levels never before seen in history, when the seduction and the temptation of sin is at a level you've never seen before, when the deception of the plan of God meaning that the enemy is deceiving you to think the plan of God is not coming to pass or it's not coming to pass in the way you think it should, will cause many people to be offended. They'll be offended at the fact they're being persecuted. Well, they should love me. I I know many people that I have taught to do the will of God that when their family stands against them and opposes them, they look at me and say, Why do they hate me? I'm like, it's because you love God. And it confuses them. There's a lot of people that look at me and say, I just don't understand why they don't like me. I say, what do you not understand? The Bible declares if you love Jesus, the world will hate you. You're not of the world. The world will hate you. And the reason is knowing that to not be offended. To be offended means to change your actions based on somebody else. Which means if somebody persecutes you, if they do something against you for you to change your faithfulness to the Lord based on what they're doing. And a lot of people will do that. Because of the persecution of the church, there's a lot of people that will deny the Lord. It's called the great falling away. And that right there will damn your soul to hell. And damn your soul to the lake of fire, where you will be ever eternally separated from the Lord, fully conscious of that choice. So we need to prepare ourselves. This is the dynamic. The judgments of God are not against you. Judgments of God are against them that oppose the Lord and his anointed. Okay, so they're not against us. Good. But in that generation, there's going to be immense pressure, martyrdom, persecution, seductions, temptations, deceptions. Do not be deceived. Don't be offended. Don't be seduced. And remain faithful unto the Lord. And if you do that, if you go all the way and you remain faithful, you will see God. Because it is the pure in heart to see the Lord. Father, we thank you for it. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. And we will see you tomorrow. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow. Oh, the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons. The drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I? The sun's now